So you had a letter you wanted to read real quick, Anthony? Oh yeah, if you don't mind, so I got a letter from a from a fellow, uh, and I it, I thought it, it's it's a it, it was a great letter, uh, completely unsolicited, and it kind of addresses a lot of the things that motivates us to do street epistemology. So let me just get into it here. Hi, Anthony. You don't know me, but I'm here to thank you for teaching me the basis of street epistemology. I'm a 38-year-old man from Brazil, married to a theist woman for six and a half years. Religion never was a problem for us, and we decided if we ever had kids, we would teach them about religions when they reached the age of reason. Long story short, recently our veterinarian died in a stupid motorcycle accident, and my wife, as all human beings, was having problems dealing with his death. To be clear, we weren't close to him, but our two dogs are like kids, and he saved one of them twice. So even though we weren't close, he did leave a strong mark on us. When we started talking about it, and I was trying to show her what my views of life and death are, I saw a chance to try a bit of street epistemology that I saw from your videos. So I started asking her questions. When we reached the point of faith, we got stuck. So I decided to tell her about the fire-breathing dragon I've been keeping in the garage for the past couple of years. I told her I believe it on faith and that our youngest dog helps me take care of it. She laughed and the conversation ended there. The very next day, she said that after our conversation, she started doubting and is now asking questions. I'm doing my best to show her how to use the tools she has to arrive at a conclusion by herself. I don't know what that conclusion will be, but I'm excited to help her along the path. At one point, she said that she was starting to believe me, and I told her that she shouldn't. She should do the research herself and try to figure out things for herself and not just rely on what others say, even when the others are her husband or mother. In moments of crisis, she prays and she feels that her God helps her, and she doesn't want to be alone. In that case, I asked her to imagine for a moment that there is no God, and she knows that. In what scenario, who does she think helped her? She answered, me, and is starting to question more. Funny thing is, we've had these conversations about a thousand times before, but I was telling, not asking. The first time I started asking questions opened up a universe of possibilities. I can't thank you enough for the journey I see opening up for us both. She is also excited about it, but at the same time, a bit terrified and yet really seems open to all possibilities. So thank you very much for showing me street epistemology. And if you have any advice on how to better help her explore things, that will be very welcome. And I absolutely love that, that letter um, from this individual. Awesome. Great story. Absolutely. I, I would imagine, Reed, are you starting to get kind of feedback like that from people watching your content? Every once in a while, maybe once every few months. I was just going to say, it's really nice to hear that there was a change in the attitude in the conversations. And I really like that. He said, instead of telling people, he just started asking more. And it's so, it, it's like his worldview did, hadn't changed in these conversations. It was just entirely how he approached the conversation. And suddenly, you know, some of these more deeper questions are being asked. And I also appreciated that he knew that his job wasn't to tell her what was true and what was not true. Um, and I, when I try to have these conversations, I try to not make that my goal either. Um, it's always just to open up the dialogue in the first place to get people to that state of thinking. So I, I, I really like that, that letter. That was really nice. Yeah, it definitely touched on a lot of things that, that we find important when we're doing SE, that, that idea of asking questions, not guiding people, rather than you know challenging what they think is true by asking questions and giving them time to process it even though she might be saying i don't know if she was saying this but it sort of he sort of implied it that maybe she was asking him for the answers and he resisted he resisted uh trying to influence her and trying mm -hmm. to let her figure it out on her own so that was really great so when you when you hear something like that jonas i'm a little curious it, keeping in mind like the research that you're involved in, what goes through your mind when you when you see stuff like that? Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think there's a lot in there that we'll probably end up touching on in our conversation today. I mean, first of all, there's how difficult it is for someone to change their minds. Um, that 
and also uh, one of the uh, underlying reasons it's difficult for us to change our minds has to do with our social relationships. Uh, I think it was mentioned in the letter that uh, maybe some of her beliefs were tied to her family and her mother and uh, where the beliefs come from and, and how they form and when they form in the course of our lives is very important um, because uh, social re relationships tend to help maintain our beliefs and to keep them steady when we share them with other people. Um, and then you have an interesting situation uh, where uh, it, within the marriage there are different beliefs and, um, and how the, a husband and a wife resolve those things is, is really interesting because that's, that might be also part of the, the key to how, how beliefs change is through negotiation with, with other people that we care about. Mm -hmm. And of course all of the other things you said about, uh, about methods of, of asking questions and avoiding uh, direct full frontal attacks that, that make people defensive in, in, in trying to change their minds is, is really mm -hmm. important. There was other, one other thing about that, that letter right at the start where they mentioned a good friend had died. I'm wondering, do you see, have you ever come across any studies that might suggest that people who might have experienced a loss or, 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 or going through some sort of trauma that they might be more open or less open or in a better position to evaluate beliefs? Uh, I, I don't know of any research, but it doesn't surprise me. One of the things that makes beliefs really hard to change is when they become part of ourselves, part of our identity and who we think that we are. And once beliefs, beliefs get inside that kind of trusted circle of identity, the brain then protects them as if they're part of ourselves, part of our body worth protecting. And I think often events like the one described, a loss, a, a death, are times when we question ourselves and our identity. And uh, we, we may have a little bit of looseness there in the identity, a little bit of uh, fluidity to the self um, in those moments that allows us to question things a little bit more.